I did try publishing a study actually when I was 16 and it got rejected because it wasn't really a study. It was more just like a stream of consciousness. And the, the like when I was 16, I was like kind of into politics and I was like stupid. So it was very politically driven. But that was when I was like, man, fuck all this politics shit. Like, if if someone who has an original thought can't publish what he wants to publish, then modern science as we know it is done. It's just, it's completely screwed. I mean, I did upload it to Reddit. Um, but yeah, I deleted it later. I have nothing on my Reddit anymore. I delete all my Reddit posts after a while. I was like really insecure. Um, and I only wrote like a synopsis of it. I didn't I didn't actually post the full study. It was like six pages, but yeah. I only wrote it to sound smart too. It was it was a bunch of BS actually. I probably would have rejected it too, to be honest, but still, you don't, re like, even the whole idea of rejecting people's proposals to, to put ideas out into the world, like, that should not even be allowed, you shouldn't be allowed to reject that, the, the, I think I have time to talk about it, the, the whole idea behind it was, is like, that Sigmund Freud's id, is not really what we think it is. And I, I took a psychology course, so I learned about this. So that was when I was like, man, there's something else here, you know, something even deeper that like super ego, ego, id, there's something deeper that has a like singular, near impossible to comprehend, like core command, and near impossible to comprehend. That's me just, that's, um, speculation just to make it sound cool for myself it could be very easy to comprehend just with the right perspective or with the right teacher and um the whole idea behind the score command is that like it isn't actually all like selfish or whatever like the lizard brain that um everyone just assumes that it is and it was like our interpretation of the many complexities of this deeper mind leads us to the idea of the id which is much more complex but it's not the core it's not the deepest it's not the lowest part of the brain the id is a very surface level thing in actuality um and it's very misunderstood for being simple but rather there's something deeper like not even brainstem but even further like it's like it may be organelle based in all of the cells in our body, like just DNA based. And the emergence of the combined intelligence of trillions and trillions of amoeba like intelligences among our entire body leads us to, to be what we are now. It could be the emergence of all that intelligence that caught that constitutes what we consider as intelligence in the social definition of it so like the general idea that people understand in psychology is that everything we do is for our id okay this is actually less psychological and more philosophical um as to how we operate in regards to these but generally a lot of people like to think i don't even think it's the majority but a lot of people like to think that everything we do is for our id that like nothing we do deviates from this nothing at all so if you understand the core mechanics of the monkey brain then you'll understand why everyone has done everything they've ever done ever and the way the way a lot of people like to see it is um is not that th there's like, there's this part of us that wants to eat and drink and procreate and, and whatever and have these basic needs and play these games and stuff. 
like the lizard brain, it's not that they look at it as having these attributes and they say, oh, this is the deepest part of the brain, so we're going to call it the id. No, most people I know who, who prescribes this idea just call whatever they find in the deeper parts of the brain the id. And whatever they happen to find is whatever they happen to find. So from that perspective, the id is exactly what it is. The id is anything I can describe beyond this. So if I say, no, the deepest part of the brain actually doesn't care about procreating, then they'd say, okay, then the id does not care about procreating. Because to them, whatever the id is, is the deepest part of the brain. That's how they define it. Um, they don't define it based on its characteristics. They figure out what characteristics it is, and they define it. And they, they call those characteristics the id. But the, the contribution that I made... Well, contribution, quote unquote, because I never actually contributed it, like in reality, was that the attributes that we associate with the deepest part of our brain are not accurate or not the deepest parts. So, for example, one of these core principles that um, the id likes is to play games, right? Now, it might seem like this is, you know, shaved down to its very core. But there's a realization that you have when growing up, and it's it's not something that we can ever explain with words, what, it, what a game is. You realize that pretty quickly. We probably never will, actually. Like, what is a game? It's a, it's a brutally complex thing to try to explain. Um, you can explain it in very simple terms, but... There's always more complex explanation you can get out of that. But despite being very complex and near impossible to actually explain to somebody with, with words, possibly because of our limited words, but despite that, it's innately understood on a certain level. Like, people can agree on what games are. And humans are born with the desire to play games and a hatred for cheaters. Like this is, generally speaking, I'm, I'm not going to get too specific into like game theory and stuff, but um, I'm just trying to say like there is a nature behind this. And just like most other animals, like if you want to see a pure animal brain, you get a dog and watch it, how it behaves. Watch how, like, the stupidest things will make you laugh because it acts like a human. It just wants to play and play and play nonstop. And you realize how simple and rudimentary its behavior actually is. And we see deep within ourselves that we aren't so different from dogs at our core, which makes us laugh because it's because laughing is kind of like tearing a hole into which we can see our subconscious. It's incredibly pure. And you don't need to get past, you don't need to really expend any mental effort to, to brush through, to peel back a thousand different layers of social dynamics and the cloudiness of sexual desire and the absurd amount of heuristic biases that we have for other humans. Not to say that we don't have uh, biases towards dogs as well. There's a reason why dogs even exist in the first place. But there's quite a few barriers that are being dissolved here when you're studying dogs rather than humans. And there's even the, the whole idea of the fact that human beings have such a level of intelligence that there's a very strong barrier keeping you from entering their mind simply because you don't know what their intention is upon examination but it's very clear to understand how dogs operate and then there's also language itself which as as wonderful as language is for teaching for teaching and learning in a very efficient manner i am of the belief that the words that people speak put them into 
creative boxes and don't let them think outside of it or make it very difficult for them to think outside of it. And without language, if you're forced to think all in your own head, just pure thoughts, pure understanding the world around you, um, then that's about as limitless as human thought gets. So there's that barrier as well. And when you're dealing with dogs, I mean, they're not speaking to you. So there's no restrictions. Well, very few restrictions being put on you when examining them or observing. Observing is the better word. So, like, in my opinion, observing humans isn't really the most ep economical way to observe to, or to understand the core of humans. Like, seeing the way dogs behave, that's us at our core, in its purest form. You're better off just doing that. That's a more efficient way. And in a way, if you're going for a very shaved-down understanding here, a very Occam's razor understanding here, then don't bother studying humans. Just study dogs. And like rats, too, I guess. But dogs are awesome, so study them instead. And although that might seem like a joke that I just said, like a joke of an answer, like just study dogs because they're awesome. From a from a psychological perspective, that's not trivial what I said. Simply because it's awesome is actually merit enough to for um for there to be a consideration for people to choose to study dogs over rats. Um, another thing people believe that the id wants is to survive, right? Which kind of goes hand in hand with playing games. Like, if you want to survive for a long time... Actually, no, this kind of goes against it. Because... And I'll get into that. Because games are risky. And the... The more people enjoy games, the more they actually risk their lives, which is why the gender that enjoys games at a higher level also dies sooner and takes more risks. Playing games risks your survival. Like, that's how this works. On an individual level, it risks, it risks your survival. But if you're a slave to your species, then playing games, in a way which I can make an argument for. And a lot of people can make an argument for. And this is pretty solid, actually. People who enjoy games the most are actually the ones who ensure the survival of the rest of the species. So, yeah. I don't want to explain that one. You should kind of already understand if you're like at least like 13 years old. You take the risks so that others don't have to, essentially. And another another thing that people think the aid wants is to procreate, and that's obvious, right? Everyone gets that. I can't argue with that one either. But, like, all of these... When you really understand what, what the id is and what it drives you towards, the words can't do it justice. Like, even procreation, as, as simple as you might make it seem in your head, you really examine it, it can mean, like, 15 different things. Like, some people just want sex. And from a Darwinistic perspective, that means you want to procreate, right? Because in a natural sense, sex leads to procreation. But they use birth control. And, like... I always say nothing is trivial. Nothing is meaningless. You can't just, oh, but they use birth control, so let's not factor that in. No, but they do. They do use birth control. So does that mean they really want to procreate? Because there's a smarter, more sophisticated, more long-term thinking part of their brain that's going, no, I don't want to procreate, and I'm actively making a decision against that. The monkey brain wants us to do this thing that just feels good. And it tells us to go do it. So we obey its command. But we don't actually, a different part of our brain doesn't want that outcome. It doesn't want the outcome of that action. And if 
if who we are has worked all this time to keep us alive as a species, then there's, there's no discounting the idea that this is also a part of who we are. There's no way for you to really say that the things that we're doing right now in any way are unnatural, that, uh, that there's anything about, you know, GMOs or vaccines or the simulation or anything like that or video games or, or like the internet, that any of this is unnatural. It's who we are. It's what we've created. And and with procreation, some people out there truly want offspring. And what's more is they want it with the right people. So they'll go out of their way to make sure they abstain from the act that leads to procreation with anybody else until they find the one that's right for them. Because they don't want to expend the effort of raising a child that, with the genetics of a partner that they don't want. And they also don't want to, have to deal with the guilt of leaving that child. So they'll wait for it. They'll wait for the right partner. And um, that's, that's the most obvious way that people can continue their genes in the gene pool. And now uh, you can assume that from a Darwinistic perspective, our genetics would continue on in an in a efficient and constantly improving, quote-unquote, way. But what's interesting is why exactly when men in particular, when they get the opportunity to procreate with other women, they choose not to. Like, monogamy is quite odd, actually, when you think about it from that perspective. It's not odd when you look at it from what humans have been doing. But if you look at it from the perspective that we're all going to survive and that um, that there isn't, like, there's billions of people in the world and we don't live in a small tribe of 150 people and um, human life has very little value in that scheme, but... It is easy to understand if you look at human history, but from the perspective of what we have going on right now, on first glance, if you weren't educated, monogamy seems kind of foolish, actually. Like, if the goal of your of your genetics, right, is simply to pass on as much of itself, as much of th that genetics as possible to the future generations, then why ever turn any woman down, ever? Like, women turning men down, that makes sense. Even in, in the worst case scenario. Understandable, right? Limited supply, limited supply of eggs, limited supply of time, limited supply of mental bandwidth, or emotional bandwidth, I should say. And you're out of commission for nine months. Um, and then there's an unrivaled emotional attachment that you have to the child, which forces you to dedicate time and effort to them for much, much longer than nine months. So you really, you're out of commission in the, in the sexual marketplace for years, at least. So, so for girls, okay. But for guys, why stay faithful? Like if you consider it from a very, very basic understanding of evolution, Monogamy really doesn't make sense. But that's from a very basic understanding. You know, it, it actually gets super interesting. Even just procreation, when you look at it in terms of the it. Because there's quite a few people out there who, like, can't have kids, actually. Like, women become infertile very quickly as they age. Uh, it's actually kind of scary because if I want to have a, if I want to have a child, like if I want someone to birth my child, if I wait like another 15 years, my chances of finding a girl my age to, um, to get pregnant, like the chances actually drop dramatically unless I choose a significantly younger girl than myself. Which, um, 
like obviously the majority of girls will still be fertile at that age but the difference is not meaningless it's it's significant enough to be a factor in deciding your lifestyle and what's weird is people choose to adopt if the purpose of your id was truly just to pass down your genes to the next generation and not preservation of the species then why the hell would people care so much about their adopted children why would they treat their adopted children as if they were their own children even with the knowledge that uh oh no slippery slope because it's not like it's not like the id would ever even know that they're adopted if you can fool the id which is not a difficult thing to do it's not like it would ever even realize oh i just thought of that just now Mm. but then again then again we like we care about dogs we care about raising dogs we care about raising other pets we care about nieces and nephews but then again they're they're blood but we also care about children in general maybe not everyone but from what i've seen most people if they have the opportunity to whether or not the child is even closely related to them at all even distantly related they'll still put in some efforts if they have the opportunity to to um you know do what's best for the child in that moment teach them a thing or two maybe make them laugh and be have a bit of fun with them like they're not indifferent to other humans just because they're far from them genetically which considering how long society's been around and how complex society has been and how how much it's evolved over the millennia over the many millennia that we've been here you would think that um such an effort would be inefficient it would be misplaced you would think that that kind of that kind of behavior would not necessarily be the most incentivized thing by nature right considering how many concessions and compromises our body makes even for ourselves so yeah it it starts to it starts to call into question the whole idea that the id cares about procreation done and done the done deal nothing else needs to be said keep it simple you know it starts to call into question the idea that maybe it's not so simple maybe procreation isn't this like isn't this thing that you could just say and expect everybody to understand truly what the id wants maybe there's more to it than that you know now i'm a strong believer in being able to reshape and rewire your id and um not from the standpoint i'm i'm talking about from the standpoint of what people refer to the id as like the whole um the part of our brain that you know that salivates when it sees tasty food and when it smells good food or you know the part of our brain that um chases survival chases the comfort that wants to run away from something that doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that wants to play games that wants to have sex you know that i'm a firm believer that from the standpoint of what people refer to as the id from like a social perspective or like from a psych- psychology 101 perspective that thing that we refer to we can rewire that we can reshape that it's malleable you know i'm a, i'm a believer of that but not this deeper thing that i'm talking about this deeper thing the reason why i think it exists is because i think there's parts of our brain that we can't rewire which is why i think that this is a thing that exists and it it's not just um it's not just involuntary implicit regulate the chemistry of the brain regulate our breathing regulate our heartbeat um like muscles atp that sort of no 
I think there is behavioral traits and decision making that come from a deep part of the brain, nature that can't be rewired. And that's why I think I can make a distinction here. Which is actually kind of crazy to say because um, I think most people believe you can rewire it. I think most people have throughout their entire lives um, to a certain degree. Because like to consciously like actually even the idea that rewiring the id is a thing like that's actually something that people don't really think about because people always refer to this sort of thing as the monkey brain the lizard brain what not lizard brain is no but people online refer to it more as lizard brain even though that i i wouldn't say that's the most accurate way of looking at it I think monkey brain is the right way to put it. Lizard brain seems to be the deeper part, but lizard brain seems to be more of a involuntary and less, um, how would you say it? Less metaphorically soulful, less emotional, you know? Less social side of things. It seems to be more pure chemistry, pure survival. You know, but the idea for the human brain, which is kind of just like an add on, you know, it's like a DLC, really, to be telling the monkey brain how it should do its job. You know, like, that's absurd. But I mean, you take psychology 101, you start doing a bit of a retrospection. Retrospection, is that the right word? Yeah, I think it is. Then yeah, you know you know that idea isn't so um it isn't so black and white. And at the end of the day, like this whole thing is just like an exercise in mental gymnastics. All we're really talking about is just like a random arrangement of gooey brain matter all working together. Like there's so much overlap that compartmentalizing these sorts of things is it's it's an exercise in it's a futile exercise in linguistics is really all this is the compartmentalization we're talking about has no bearing on the the reality of our own situations and i doubt it'll ever help us to to live more prosperous lives if we ever are able to compartmentalize and categorize things like this and assign them actual words, you know? It really is just all brain matter. Now, there's different perspectives of looking at this. It could be that your brain at its deepest level never really changes. And what changes is a middle level that we call the id. And in fact, I think that's actually the only infallible way of looking at it. Because if the if the human brain really can influence the monkey brain, then the monkey brain isn't actually 100% in charge. There's something else that's in charge that's regulating both the human brain and the monkey brain. And... Um, I believe that. I believe that there is something. So, look, some something has to be in charge. It has to be. It's not like nothing can be in charge. But the fact that you can rewire what people consider to be, you know, their core preferences, their desires, you know, people can become monks and things like that. The fact that these things are possible means that there's something deeper doing the rewiring and like okay what do i mean though like when i say that it can be rewired what do, okay I, i'll i'll get to a proper example in a minute but like say with procreation okay there's even people out there actually who 
just want kids, and this is piggybacking off what I said earlier, there's people out there who just want kids, and that's it. That's the desire. Like, they just want to raise the kids. And they don't care about the procreation aspect of it. They don't care about passing on their genes. Deep down, they probably do. But on the surface, like, understanding-wise, like, consciously, they don't really care if they pass on their genes or not. With, uh, with the awareness that they're not passing on their genes. But, like, there are people out there who could care less if their genes live on. And I don't know how common or rare that actually is, but I know not everyone feels that way. I, most people want a combination of all three. I can bet on that. So I think people watching this, a few, quite a few people watching this, might be confused when I say that. But I know this is true because I am one of those people. And everyone says I'm so weird. Because, like, like, a lot of people don't want kids, especially my age. I want kids, dude. I want to adopt. Like, if I adopt versus if I reproduce a child, like, if I reproduce and have a child and um, they have half my genes, it doesn't affect me one way or another. It doesn't sway me at all. The reason why I want to adopt, though, the reason why I actually prefer adoption is because there's a bunch of kids out there who don't have a parent, and it just feels like I'd be doing a double positive by parenting one of them rather than bringing someone new into the world to parent. It feels like I'm killing two birds with one stone, you know? And Okay, that, that could also be because I don't have, you know, particularly good genes. Um, if you don't know, like I'm... I don't want to talk. Okay, maybe that might just be me um, having low self-worth. But I don't think I have low self-worth. I think it's accurate. I don't think my genes are all that, um, uh, how would you say it, appealing? I mean, that's not really my call to make. That's like, oh, shit. I, I, no, that's not my call to make. I can't, I can't say that. It's the females that, that can make that call, not me. But I really don't care about the whole idea of, like, creating the best version of myself to live on after I die. You know? That, like, second chance of life. I don't care. I'd rather just help somebody else as a friend. I'd rather treat my child like a friend and just help them live their best life. Like, when I die, I'm... It's, it's a relief to me. That I am immortal. That I am a mortal. It's, it's cathartic when I think about it. Like when I die, I want everything that is me to die with me. Like take my notes, wipe them, um, you know, wipe everything off the hard drives on my computer for obvious reasons. I'm just kidding. I don't keep any of that stuff on my computer. But, you know, delete my social media accounts. Burn all the cash that I have. Let that be what raises the dollar value for everyone else. Um, leave my YouTube channel because my YouTube channel is much more than just me. It's a lot of other content that I, I consider to be education um, and entertainment. And I think you can detach the, art, the arts from the artist in that case. That's, like, that's the legacy I want to leave. But get rid of everything else, like my cars and all that stuff. Like get rid of all of it. Let whatever is me just die right along with me. I don't really care about immortalizing myself, making a statue of myself or whatever, you know? Etching my name into stone. Doesn't it doesn't um doesn't appeal to me. To me, the part that I long for, the part that I yearn for, is the idea of like taking another person and making them the best person they can be. And that's actually solely what I care about. Now, I would be lying if I said that there's probably subconscious ulterior motives and I do want to have my genes pass on to the next generation. But consciously, all I can really say for certain, 
consciously at least, which may not even be certain if you really think about it, but from my own self-analysis, as biased as self-analysis gets, that's really all I care about. Like, I don't need the two other, th like, I used to enjoy sex, not anymore, I'm burnt out. And actually, completely contrary to the idea that people just want to pass on their own genes, people commit suicide. How the hell does that fit that theory, huh? Where the hell does depression play into the whole, like, see, see you take one subject in psychology and it teaches you about the id, and it tells you that everything we do, we do it for a reason. And then you take a different topic in psychology and you learn about depression and they never make the connection and they never go, well, what's the reason for this? Like the, what's like the, the core reason for why we get depressed? Like we know what, like what depression is, but why, why has evolution baked that into us so deeply that it's, it's, it's it seems to have a genetic component to it. It seems to be very deeply intertwined with our nature. It seems to exist in every single society on earth, regardless of how small or big or what kind of people are in it. Even uncontacted tribes that don't even know other parts of the world exist, they still have people that experience depression and like uh, schizophrenia or whatever. But like, and actually, that can be included in this as well, but I don't really, uh, that's not, that's not all that interesting to me, honestly. Schizophrenia is, um, I'm sure that if I really dug deep, I would probably become lazy and just chalk it up to, uh, chemical errors, you know? That's ultimately what I would chalk it up to. But, like, depression is, um, is something that you really have a tough time explaining from the perspective that everything we do and experience is for these reasons that the id wants, that this, that for the purposes of passing on our genes and that sort of thing, you know? When you incorporate a Darwinistic perspective, which, in my opinion, is the only real perspective that you can confidently say you will make assumptions based off of. Um, like, at, at its lowest threshold, where if you're looking at things from a philosophical perspective, you don't really care if things are reasonable to make assumptions off of. You're going to question everything. But... Even from a philosopher's perspective, having that as a baseline is literally the most reasonable baseline to have. Everything else you can question. But I think it's a good idea for most people to go into to all kinds of sciences with an understanding of the, the evolutionary perspective behind things. And... When you include that, how the hell does suicide fit in there? Or depression, you know? Like, we as humans are incredibly sophisticated. Like, even at a young age, babies, like, before they can even speak, you know, they show signs of nuanced social behavior. Like, they ignore people, they, they have rudimentary pranking um, they try to hide, uh, they try to sneak toys that they know will be taken away, um, candy that they know will be taken away, they, um, they make attempts to break out of the safety of their environment and go explore the world, just morbid curiosity to the point of self-destruction, and now it can be said that it can be said that a much greater percentage of our brain is sophisticated while only a tiny part of our brain is the lizard brain i'm talking cognitive ability wise not like uh not like actual physical size wise 
um, and, and the tiny part of our brain that craves like the food and sex and all that. And as they say, as they say, when that part takes over, a stiff dick has no conscience. So, so let's boil it down. Let's, let's isolate the situation here to only include the animal brain, okay? Let's really look at what's going on deep down. Like rats, for example. Naturally, the purest instinct within us, you know, the very core, is this desire to live, right? This desire to live and procreate, to continue our genetics. Evolutionary biologists will say so. Um, psychologists will almost always agree. Philosophers, on the other hand, won't be so quick to jump to that conclusion. And, okay. All right, I'll get into it. I'll get into it. A great experiment done where they were able to successfully rewire the brain at what we consider the core functions, the, the whole um, survival even though suicide throws that out the window and we never talk about that because suicide is such a taboo subject, but the um, this experiment where we were able to rewire the brain at the at the these commands, the survival, procreation, um, actually that's really it. But survival and procreation entails many other things. Survival entails the the desire to breathe and have shelter and um have safety and comfort and food and water and all that stuff you know so the there was this experiment i forgot who did it it was done in the 60s as all the great experiments were and obviously these kinds of experiments aren't done today they're considered cruel and unusual punishment but I laugh at that because laughing is how I cope. But, but I, I want to preface that because if I ever speak on like tragic things in the future, I'm going to be laughing. And don't think I'm laughing just to like laugh at it. Laughing is what I do when I feel like crying. I have a very hard time actually crying. I, I wish I cried more. I wish I experienced events that made me cry more. But things that make me sad, just I just laugh at them. And I, I don't have much control over it. And there is, there is nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Socially, I guess, sure. But it's a thing that I experience and I'm not alone in that. But what this experiment was, is um, it was brutal. It was, it was done back when these things weren't really regulated and people could really figure out the secrets of the universe. So, okay, the, the way that it worked is it was to create a social utopia very similar to the ones that we as humans so desperately seek. So the path that we're on as humans, we wanted to simulate that, to experience what's in store for us in the future, you know, to see that, to, to get a lens into the future. And so what what's going on in the world right now? People today seek to make life easier. Online dating, living in dense cities to get more social interaction, uh, more friends, more sex, more food, more social, uh, social media, more attention, you know, more, more, more. Um, it's why these densely populated cities attract a very specific kind of political ideology. And by extension, people who prefer a hedonistic lifestyle are attracted to that. A very painless lifestyle, right? Because being alone, being bored, um, not having enough friends, not having enough sex, not having enough food, not like these things are antithetical to the hedonistic lifestyle. They're, they're painful. They're literally painful. So... What this experiment was is this guy created a, basically a utopia for rats. Um, actually, I did. It, I believe he did it with rats and mice. Um, on separate occasions, so these rats and mice, 
they had unlimited food and water and mates and luxuries and toys and all the kinds of toys you can think of giant living areas everything is clean everything is sanitized you know um and at first things were going great you know population rose like mad as you would expect but after a certain point for some reason the population growth started to like decelerate um and the the experiment started with four rats i believe and very quickly it went into the hundreds but it never went into the thousands and now keep that in mind um damn it's been a while since i've looked at the experiment but i i remember i remember quite a few details about it i was i was like 16 years old so at first glance when you look at the experiment it like life was easy it totally could have gone into the thousands like the population like there's no real reason why it wouldn't they had more than enough food to hit a thousand rats and it actually makes you kind of wonder why the hell in very prosperous human societies are people having fewer and fewer children like why is that just happening why is it that the population stops growing after a certain points like we have the resources to go well beyond 9 billion but we're not going to go past 9 billion not on earth we're not going to go past 9 billion um well uh, around around 9 billion 9 billion is maybe 9 and a half you know i don't know what the latest estimate is but we totally could we're just not gonna and when you look at this experiment they had more than enough food to hit 1000 rats they had more than enough food to hit 5000 rats but they never hit that the population just stopped growing at like a few hundred i can't remember exactly how many it was but it just stopped it just hit a ceiling how exactly well here's the first thing okay this is why i'm going to preface this again I was 16. I was deeply enveloped in the politics. It was idiotic. I was a complete idiot. And um the reason why I published this, I've written things like this in the past. The reason why I published this one in particular was because I was so politically driven and so uh outraged at seemingly nothing. I guess just teenage hormones, just a part of life. I guess wanting to be angry at really nothing in particular but I just wanted to preface that that that, that my contribution was very political which is that's why it got rejected but the the what started happening when the population started to stagnate is like the big rats and by big I mean like the fat ones like the literal big ones um because they had enough they had unlimited food so a lot of rats started to get really big they actually started to as for lack of a better word become haters on the normal sized rats sound familiar i'm not going to make you jump to any conclusions the way i did in the paper but i guess life was just too easy for them and they had no conflict so they needed to manufacture some sort of conflict out of nothing to keep themselves busy Oh that is me jumping into conclusions. I guess I'm still a little stupid kid. I'll jump to conclusions. Forget it, whatever. But remember, there's no reason like like I'm I'm doing this to study psychology, or right? I'm doing this to study the mind, to study myself, to understand who what really makes me who I am, right? So remember why we're talking about this. Like we're here to figure out the purposes for this stuff the reason there's no need for them to do this though there's no real intuitive reason for them to be angry at the normal sized rats like they have unlimited freedom they can choose any kind of lifestyle they want to live but 
yet they choose to hate on the normal rats anyways. Like they choose to experience more negative emotion. And then the next thing that happened was monogamy fell apart. And when monogamy falls apart, the first group of of the rats affected is the semi-competent males. Not the hyper-competent ones and not the lazy ones, but the semi-competent ones who deserve, quote-unquote, deserve to, to be with the females, but aren't actually not going to end up with females because uh, monogamy is just torn to shreds. And rats, it's crazy that they did this because they aren't really smart enough to understand what they're doing. They just do whatever they feel like. And the upper crust of the males and then the rest of the females socially abandon the rest of the male rats. And many of the male rats started to resent the rest of the rat society, rat and mouse society, for basically treating them like shit when they weren't even doing anything wrong. And as a result, they became isolated. Um, They stopped interacting at the same social level. And whenever they would interact, they would get violence. And they're almost like, they almost turn into like recluses, saying screw you to society for treating me like shit for nothing. I'm going to go play video games. That, that sort of attitude, you know? And then what came of it was the female rats started showing signs of toxic masculinity. And now this is a conversation for another day. Like, the 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 whole idea of toxic masculinity as it's used today. That's a, actually a very female thing from a, from a clinical perspective. All the things that people associate with toxic masculinity, like slut shaming and incidences of rape, jealousy, insecurity, and so on, they're all found when... The, It's a female-dominated scenario when there's more females than males. That's when toxic masculinity arrives. And it almost exclusively arrives in females before it arrives in males. But that's a discussion for another day. But what's interesting is rats aren't much different from humans in that regard. And just like real life, the same was true here. And then out of nowhere, out of nowhere, this was crazy. When I, when I found out about this, it was crazy. This actually made me go like, no, nah, no way. This study's fake. This study is, is the guy who, who published this is lying. Like, I did not believe this. But considering what I know now, I believe it. So what happened was, is essentially overnight, the females started neglecting their, their children. And this happened across the board. But what was even more scary was like, they started to sort of, in a way, like hate the male rats, like with a passion and not hate the male rats for abandoning them because the females were the ones who abandoned the males. But they started to hate the male rats who made an attempt to take care of the young. It was it was an all-around kind of hate. It was a very robust kind of hate. And then you saw the females start to act incredibly aggressively towards their kids. And you know what? I know people like that in real life who um who tell kids that they should consider deciding what gender they are, trying to put bullshit in their heads. Look, it doesn't matter what your political leaning is. Even insinuating the idea that your kids even are a gender or that they can choose their gender or that genders are even a thing, even bringing up those words to your kids at at a very young age seems like a really stupid idea. For For their formative years and several years beyond that, I'm of the firm belief that you should let kids just figure the world out on their own and learn by example at that. But putting these ideas into their head is absolute 
absolute garbage, garbage people. I, I actually, it was around this time when I was 16, I think I was either 16 or 17, when I came across, randomly, I came across a child beauty pageant. I saw it happening at some, like, college event or something. Like, what? The, I don't even know what it was. But it was, like, you think about that for a second. That's literally adults forcing their kids to be used as tools for their own, like, flex competition rather than, like, actual kids. But, hey, I mean, I was a... I could be considered a recluse by many people. I spend all my time on my computer, you know? Not so much anymore, but in, in, during that time period, that's what I had going on. So if I, uh, if I went up to that beauty pageant, the child beauty pageant, and tried to say anything, they'd probably be like, oh, look at this racist, sexist, sexist homophobic Nazi. I mean, it's not the first time that's happened when I tried to do something good. So, like, fuck that. Why should I try to step in and stop it? Why should I try to be... Why should I try to let a paternal instinct guide me to do what I believe is right if everyone else is going to tell me that that I'm bad because that's just the kind of person I am deep down and we should build a society where men can uh, don't exist and women can reproduce without men. Okay, fine by me. Have fun with their traumatized kids. The world's going to turn their back on me. I'm going to turn my back on the world. So you could see how my personal biases played into this um, paper I was writing. And it's interesting because for humans, around 75% of criminals grow up with only a single parent at some point in their home. And about 80% of them are female single parents. And you can argue that that like the majority of single parents who raise children are female. But I just think it's kind of interesting how people always want to talk about toxic masculinity and how men raise their kids wrong and how women know better. Yet when you look at the stats, the conclusion you come to is the conclusion you come to from looking at the stats. Now, I'm not going to tell you what conclusion to come to in this particular case. You form your own opinions. But because of what happened, the young rats started dying, and uh, the mothers didn't actually care all that much. I know people like that in real life. Dying in a in a different sense. Not dying in a... In real life, not, not necessarily dying like... Dying, dying, but in more of a metaphorical sense. You know, their childlike wonder, their curiosity, their uh, what what makes them human died. They became just empty vessels for for bacteria to live on as a mothership. It's really all they were. They were hardly even human. And then, and then, it happened. The hikikomoris showed up. And hikikomori for um, hikikomori for those of you who don't know, is a term used to describe people who are extremely reclusive and they just isolate themselves from society. Like they just don't want to deal with society. It's uh, it's a Japanese term, hikikomori. Obviously, that's a Japanese term. Um, and for these people, it just society isn't worth it to them. I'm not even joking. Like when I when I say that, like I'm I'm. Realizing now that what I'm saying sounds crazy, but this really actually happened. And guess what? All of the hikikomoris were all male rats. Hmm, sound familiar? If you know a bit about developing countries, particularly the most prosperous, arguably the most prosperous country on planet Earth, relative to its size, that should sound familiar. And these rats didn't mate, obviously, right? They didn't even have social interactions. No way they would mate. Um, they didn't care about making it up in, in their world, um, uh, about, about self-improvement, 
which as complex as that might actually seem is a that is a very very simple concept that exists among most animals pretty much all mammals as far as I, as far as I know all mammals but um yeah all they did was just eat play games all day and sleep yeah humans and rats you know you really think about it we're not so different after all huh so the rats stopped mating and uh that prosperous country i was talking about was japan third highest gdp in the world and um not that much of a population i'll tell you that it's decreasing actually it's crazy to think about because as crazy as this experiment sounds you look at what's going on in the world like the true facts of the world and you go this is even crazier you look at what's going on in the world and all of a sudden this experiment starts to be even more believable because would like if you didn't know that japan's population is literally decreasing would you believe it like if you see what japan has going on in this highly developed nation with such an ungodly amount of resources like if if the nigerian population after being in absolute economic hell for like the entirety of the country's existence can have population growth why the hell is japan's population decreasing but uh, so so in this experiment both the males and the females were isolated from each other and of course the females were all having sex still like that that's that's not a fact that was ever going to change um in fact they were having way more sex than normal um because they desperately needed that that uh oxytocin that like loving connection that they so easily threw out the window earlier i'm sorry the personal biases but that sounds way too familiar doesn't it i got a bit angry there but yeah they were um they were only having sex with a select few male rats but eventually those male rats died um leaving only isolated male rats who already gave up on mating since the females were polygamous and these male rats I don't want to say they had enough self-respect to not go for polygamous rats because I don't even know if I can give most human beings that much credit. I mean like the id wants what the id wants, right? Lust is a powerful emotion and it would be foolish to say that they aren't they don't desire sex it would be absolutely foolish to say that but despite that it's like they all turn into masquerade they all turn into giga chads and they self respect looking at them as having self respect is a, is wishful thinking in my opinion it was all thinking on my part at least but yeah they just isolated themselves they didn't care about the females they didn't pay attention to the females they they didn't make an attempt to chase them to go after them the way that in normal society you would see the male rats and the male population in general chase after the female population to compete for them they stopped competing and um I guess it's just what happens when uh female rats live in that much luxury, you know, they just want more and more and more. So uh that's I shouldn't that's hearsay. That's hearsay and speculation. So what they're left with is isolated male rats and toxic female rats, and both groups hate each other. Um but the female rats ultimately decide on where the species goes they decide on the fate of the remainder of the species that's how it generally is with all species the females are the ones that are in control they're the ones with the limited supply they're the ones raising the babies 
usually. And um, I don't want to make any conclusions about human society based on that. Well, I, I have made conclusions on human society based on that. I don't want to say them just yet. It'll get me banned. But the males were basically shunned from the whole idea of raising the babies. They were basically deemed unworthy. No, that's hearsay and speculation. They were shunned from the idea of raising babies. Why? I don't know. I'm not a rat. I couldn't tell you. And um, the females neg neglected to raise the babies and thus formed a dying population of baby rats on top of all of this mess. And at one point, the absurd happened, which has not happened in the real world just yet. In this incredibly prosperous society, the child mortality, I mean, uh, juvenile mortality, child refers to human child. My bad, I've been saying child this whole time, I think. Yeah, the juvenile mortality rate reached 100%. Yeah, a hundred percent juvenile mortality. And at the same time, at the same time, it gets worse. At the same time, mating was at zero percent. Like a fucking meme. And now keep in mind, the same situation, okay? These rats were eating good. They had all the food they could ever want. They were drinking water. They were living it up. It was lavish, all right? Lavish lifestyles. They were living in the human equivalent of what many people consider to be a hedonistic utopia. Actually, what is uncontroversially considered to be a human equivalent to a hedonistic utopia. Not what many people could say. That, that's an understatement. Like, these rats were not getting sick. They weren't uh, dying, like, in, in, in risky ways, in, in ways where they had to struggle for food. Um, they weren't drowning. They weren't dying in, in gruesome ways. They were all basically dying of old age. And um, as such... The, these rats, like the female rats in particular, still wanted to fulfill their sexual desire. Now get this. They wanted to fulfill their sexual desires? Get this, dude. Many of the rats, especially the ones that didn't have a father figure, which at this point was almost all of them, you're not going to fucking believe this. Many of these rats turned to homosexuality. Yeah. Like I said, this kind of experiment wouldn't be done today. Not even because it's animal cruelty. That's not even the main reason why it wouldn't be done today. That's the second consideration. But the reason why the experiment wouldn't be done today is because Actually, that's the third consideration. Second reason why it wouldn't be done today is because it's controversial and people wouldn't like the results. The main reason is because the experiment would be pointless. It's already happening. If you want to observe this experiment, you could see it on a larger scale today all around you. You don't need the, this experiment. It's a small scale experiment. You have a larger one with not even a random sample. You have a larger one with an everyone sample. And it's happening right now. You can just walk outside and look at the results of the experiment. Oh, also, despite the fact that they had plenty of food and plenty of toys, somewhat of a um, kink trend developed. Uh, maybe maybe trend isn't the right word. No, trend is the right word. Where it wasn't just homosexuality that started, but like everything developed. Like they were ramping their pleasure levels to the max. So in order to crank it up, they needed to do 
more and more extreme things, right? They're not getting the, the levels of chemical pleasantness that they would naturally get in a, in a more stable and uh, more... <sighs> These things are controversial in a more monogamous society. But despite their controversy, I, I'll, 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 still, I'll still say them. I'm not going to make any real definitive conclusions just yet, but I'm not going to say any definitive conclusions just yet, but yeah, I'll, I'll still talk about the experiment. But up until the point, up until this point, the population has been just stagnant pretty much. Um, rats actually do take quite a while to die if they die of old age because they were eliminating disease completely. It was very sanitized, very sterile. Um, the population just, just wasn't growing. It was decreasing, but at the rate of like a mature company stock price, like very, very minor decreases in population, enough to be chalked up to uh, random population fluctuations. It was nothing scientifically significant. But now, despite the situation having no human interference, a complete abundance of food, space, all of that, and a population, the rats started to, like, eat each other. And this actually stemmed from the kink trend that I was talking about earlier. The population started to go down. And it's actually crazy because a certain surprising number of rats turned to cannibalism just to get their kicks, um, their, their chemical kicks, so to speak since nothing else is working for them. Behavioral sync. Okay, that's what it's called. Holy shit, dude. Universe 25. Look up behavioral sync. And they'll have the, exper the experiment like documented somewhere online. I believe it took place over a few years. And um, by the end of the few years, every single rat had died. Crazy. Like the population went extinct. And you think about that, like, that doesn't sound so familiar. But then again, it doesn't seem like we've reached that point yet. Now this begs the question. This begs the question. Doesn't this go against what our id is telling us? Doesn't this go against the whole idea that the id is truly what's in control of our minds? Like... Doesn't it kind of seem like that it contradicts Darwinistic thinking? Because, I mean, like, they had unlimited food. Or doesn't this, doesn't this, from a very, very simple, simple statement to make, doesn't this kind of call into question the Darwinistic way of thinking? Like, wouldn't they do whatever they could do to make their species continue to survive? They went extinct. Every rat died. And they had unlimited food, the highest quality of food, food that was healthy and tasted good to them. They had unlimited sex, unlimited space, unlimited toys, no disease, no drought, perfect temperatures, completely regulated temperatures. Um, this is literally what they all wanted. This is what they all chased. This is what they all in the short-term decision-making capabilities that they had, continued to dive deeper and deeper into, even till the very end, they never turned down more pleasurable experiences. They were all still driven by the animal brain. Rat brain is, is probably the right way to put it. Honestly, I don't think monkey brain is really all that accurate anymore. It's really just rat brain. But they went extinct on their own with no outside human interference, which makes me wonder. Maybe the people who are accessing more than just their animal brains on a regular basis are the ones who understand this intuitively, or they understand that there are certain things that are a part of our deep nature that 
even if you may not be able to put into words, you can still develop stories and understand people around you and learn from learn by example and you can see what resonates with you on a very deep level and learn from that and follow that advice and maybe it's these people who think on this level the more intelligent of us in society the more deserving of us in society that choose to live lives where they abandon this hedonistic idea of utopia where they choose to do things in moderation despite the option of abundance because the rats did not know what that even meant like they did everything selfishly none of them ever died a hero's death protecting another person the way that that resonates with humans none of them ever um for lack of a better word no this is a good word Actually, none of them ever chose abstinence. The only times that there were ever um, any any sort of abstinence was when um, the females hated the males. The females turned to homosexuality, which, fine, we can compartmentalize those as two different things. Even though there is great overlap among that and i have yet to see any science on that but intuitively there is great overlap between those two ideas let's compartmentalize those two differently for the sake of appealing to people's feelings we'll just compartmentalize those differently but there the situation where the females hated the males the situation where the females turned to homosexuality the, fem- the situations where the males turned to homosexuality and the situations where the males were incels, where they were involuntarily celibate. They could not get the girls, despite the fact that they probably should have to continue the species, but they couldn't. Those are the only scenarios in which the rats didn't have sex. In every other scenario, the rats have sex, had sex. There was no voluntary abstinence going on for the sake of selflessness for the sake of protecting the greater society as a whole it was all selfish like they could have just stopped eating at some point or said maybe you know what maybe i ate enough maybe maybe this is enough for me to survive Maybe in this kind of society, survival is guaranteed and I don't need to follow these um, emotional triggers that force me to become addicted to food or addicted to whatever else, you know? Maybe I could stop. That, that kind of thought process didn't exist in them. To say that it would exist within rats in general is a bit of a stretch in my opinion. But hey, who am I to say, you know? Animals are very complex creatures. But in the end, they all chose pleasure over everything else. And it's supposedly what our animal brain is telling us to do as well. Yet, if you ask an evolutionary biologist, chances are they won't even know what the hell this experiment's supposed to mean. I mean, evolutionary biologists have a hard time as it is. Like, even even recently I was looking into the chain of evolution. It's not the most solid thing ever. It's very, very solid if you want to prove to someone that evolution is a real thing. No debate about that. But in terms of giving evolutionary biologists something to really um, look at and be proud of, it's, it's, it's kind of pathetic, actually is substantial gaping holes in the chain of evolution. Nobody has any clue at all how life started. Okay, fine, that's understandable. That's not really, like, the biggest deal. Nobody's, like, super upset about that one, you know? I mean, it's it's kind of difficult to figure out that one. 
Um, but there's also this whole idea of like, no one knows if jellies formed before or after sponges. No one knows which came first. Nobody knows why it seems like the nervous system evolved twice, yet it ended up being the same thing somehow. And it just seems like that. Nobody knows if that's even a thing. It just seems like that. Nobody knows. I mean, it could, it, that could be the case, but it's extremely unlikely for the nervous system to be created in nature twice and be created in the same exact way. I mean, maybe it, maybe it isn't unlikely. Maybe it just seems unlikely. Or maybe the carbon patterns that allow for nervous systems to be created are actually fairly simple on a, on a very basic level. But nobody really knows. You, nobody knows why every other homo species died except for homo sapiens sapiens, which is us. Like, they all had large brains, same size brains. They had stronger bodies. They had... You can argue they had better sensory input in some cases. Um, they were faster. They were taller. They were stronger. They, they had tool usage. They conquered fire. They lived in many different parts of the world. But they all died. And we didn't. Like, there's so many holes in our understanding of reality as a whole the whole concept actually of just of, of it and ego and superego kind of just dissolves in your hands when you really really think deeply about it because you can look at it from like a holistic from like a um a, a personal perspective like a self-improvement perspective and it makes total sense and it's a great way of looking at the world for your own personal happiness, but looking at it from a uh, scientific perspective, from a very, from a very scrutinizing eye, it um, everything has too much overlap to give distinctive labels to. And so I wonder, what if the actual thing that we were looking for? is something much, much deeper than our understanding of the id. Because how the hell does it make sense that the, the, the id was in charge the whole time and didn't change while this experiment was happening with these rats and mice? In fact, I believe this possibility but it may not necessarily be deeper within the brain, but it may just be everywhere that there's a gap in our understanding of the brain, which, surprise, surprise, is most of the brain. Like, sleep science is still a complete mess. Um, there still isn't even really a definitive reason as to why we sleep. Yet, like, fucking every animal in the world, except for, like, ants, I think ants don't sleep, but, like, every other animal in the world sleeps, pretty much. And, like, I don't think coral sleeps either. But, like, uh, you know what I mean. But, um, even bees sleep, I believe. I th I've seen bees, like, um, take naps inside little, inside flowers. Like, sitting, napping on the petals and stuff. It was so cute. I never thought I'd see cute bees. But when they're, when they're asleep, they're really cute. But, um, Yeah. There's also this whole idea of, like, the heart problem of consciousness, which, like, a lot of the consciousness problem is actually very surface level, like the qualia behind a particular taste of chocolate. It could be that all of this talking is just a futile quest, because, like, the qualia thing just seems to be kind of irrelevant, it seems to be like this whole um, question that arises in our heads about, oh, why does this chocolate taste like the way it does? I mean, that just sort of seems to be uh, a question that is only spurred on by the emotional weight of these of these strong emotions these strong 
particularly positive emotions that we feel that forces us to ask this question. But it's, it's probably, actually no, it definitely is just these chemical reactions that give us this illusion of reality and um, make us wonder how the hell this is even a thing. When really, it's probably not even that serious. But, like, the answer behind these things, you really think about it, it's probably just impossible to comprehend. It's impossible to comprehend how the hell we can even ask that question. So, it's definitely most likely impossible to comprehend an answer to those questions, like the hard problem of consciousness. Why we even ask that is, is probably the first question we should be asking. And, and the world beyond, beyond behavioral science lies complexities so large that we simply can't understand no matter how hard we try, like in our lifetimes, you know? I mean, after all, computers can't simulate themselves because there's always a bit of compute power wasted in the act of simulation. So maybe in order to unlock the secrets of our own minds, the key isn't spending brain power on behavioral observation of others, but rather, maybe the right way to go about it is just looking within ourselves, just personal reflection, forcing the brain and brain into into an overclock state in an effort to simulate itself. Meditation, right? Isn't that what you'd call that? Where you ignore everything else and you focus entirely on the thoughts that make up your thoughts. Maybe the, maybe the full answers to a lot of these psychological questions and the question of what is the, the nature of the intelligence that's in control of our minds, maybe these questions can never truly be fully answered. Maybe the answers are just given in fragments, you know? And maybe the people who fall into Dunning-Kruger's Valley look at all this stuff that they don't know about the mind and by extension the world and just decide to call it God and, and don't bother to comprehend it. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that too. I like psychedelic hallucinations and whatnot. Oh shit, I'm tired. I'm just talking. I don't even know if I'm making sense right now. But yeah, I have a point to what I'm saying. Like with these with these psychedelics. These are things that that as far as we know, most other human species didn't really push themselves to experience. Maybe really deep down it was something greater that kept us from going extinct. Something that can never really be put into words, since spoken language itself couldn't do it justice. But maybe it could be that the geniuses of the world who had inklings of an understanding would give us stories to help us understand and rules to live fulfilling lives by. I don't know. Just a thought. But it's weird, huh? How, like, when the id is given everything it wants, it just leads to disaster. Maybe, just maybe, a more intelligent and a more in control and a more, and not even intelligent, a more experienced. Ah, experienced. Damn, what a word. What a word. Experienced. Because when you say experience in this context, you're not talking about the experience of one person. You're talking about the experiences of the, uh, the genetic 
and uh, an epigenetic nature of of a series of generations that have ancestors spanning back hundreds of thousands millions of years all going through trial and error eventually learning this stuff eventually coming to these conclusions where in the end it can be interpreted as somewhat of a collective consciousness which again is another freudian idea is it not collective consciousness and oh man shit there's a, there's a lot here actually that i didn't really think about when i was 16 but yeah maybe there's this more experienced part of your brain that when disaster starts to strike it uh it just takes over your brain and it tells your id what your id should think what it should do what it, like what it wants versus what it needs i'm no politician i'm not here to tell you how you should interpret an experiment done in the 60s i i did kind of do that but that's my mistake i shouldn't have done that i shouldn't make any conclusions about it form your own conclusions if you want to hear my take on the experiments i can tell you i can tell you what i believe the the core of 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 the human mind truly is which is generally speaking i believe that the deepest part of the brain doesn't care so much about being selfish it cares more about the prosperity of the future of the human species and being selfish just happens to be a very very optimal strategy in ensuring that the future of the species will be protected because if you're selfish and you end up on top and you end up winning chances are you have the merits and you deserve to win chances are despite how angry it may make other people feel despite how it might hurt other people's feelings despite how much i might get banned for saying that anger is not something that nature has chosen to avoid anger is something that's baked deep into us and it may be that this anger plays a very vital role actually you'd be foolish to say otherwise that it plays a very vital role in our evolution and that it may be this sort of anger and competition and hatred that people develop for each other when they really push themselves and they push other people around them and they compete and they they become selfish and they take what they can and give nothing back that allows for further competition and further growth as a species to you know get a get a one up on nature to make sure the species itself survives and maybe that's what's given human beings or homo sapiens sapiens rather the upper hand over all of the other human species i mean after all like whenever any other human species found water they became complacent they stopped they they stuck around the water and they they never left the nest they just made their nest bigger but homo sapiens sapiens didn't do that they found water water and they said screw it i'm going to go explore the world and risk my life doing so went and found easter island somehow they went and explored the desert for some reason they would find coastlines they'd find water safe safety comfort you know a nice luxurious closer one step closer to a utopian society and they said nope not interested i'd rather take the challenges i'd rather go face to face with nature and fight it and and get better and better at this fight as a species because you never know how brutal the forces of nature can be and hey that seems to have paid off pretty well after all we're the only surviving human species
and were the only species that took that risk. But I have I have some conclusions about the experiment and as to what it really means. If you if you want to hear my thoughts on the experiments, I don't want to implant any ideas in anybody's heads right now. I'd rather people just think about the experiment, sleep on it, think about it for a few weeks, a few months, like really deeply think about it. Hell, I mean, it could be a completely useless experiment. Like, I mean, there is that one lingering issue here, which is that rats aren't people. You know, that's that's a that's definitely something to consider. But I mean, uh, to each their own, I guess, you know, whether or not you choose to recognize this as a valid data set to make conclusions from is totally up to you.